Hey everybody, welcome back to a new video. Have you been trying to figure out where the new Canon EOS R8 fits in the lineup and if it should be part of your gear bag? In this video, I'll share my real world experience with the camera and how it compares to the R5 and the R6, both of which I also own. I was especially curious if this could pass as a wildlife camera. You won't want to miss what happens when I test that and I shoot at a flying bird with the electronic shutter at 40 frames per second. Also, I have a huge announcement to make in this video where someone is going to win a new $13,000 lens similar to this one. No, I'm not kidding. My name is Simon Dantremont and I'm a professional nature and wildlife photographer living in Eastern Canada. I make weekly videos giving you photo tips or taking you behind the scenes for nature photography. Subscribe if you want to see more. This video isn't sponsored, but I do want to thank Camera Canada for helping me get my hands on an R8 right away. I actually bought this camera for myself and I'm filming with it right now. So what is this camera? It's basically a, a baby R6 Mark II, the same 24 megapixel sensor and autofocus, but in a smaller lightweight body like a Canon RP. It feels light in the hand, a bit small for my hands, but still good. But to keep the price down, Canon needed to reduce or remove some of the features to get the price down to an amazing $1,500 US. There's no mechanical shutter, just an electronic first curtain shutter at six frames per second. That's an okay frame rate for fast action, but just barely, as the R6, R6 Mark II, and R5 can do 12 frames per second in comparison. But this camera can also shoot in an electronic shutter mode at a crazy 40 frames per second. Now with electronic shutter, you can sometimes get an artifact called rolling shutter, which comes from the sequential reading of the sensor data while your subject is moving in the frame. I'm happy to say that while I could tilt trees by panning sideways, it wasn't too bad and was less with the electronic first curtain shutter. If you're shooting fast cars driving in front of telephone poles, you'll notice, but for most scenarios, it won't matter a lot. Here's a few shots while panning left and right at some trees and you can indeed see some tilting of the trees. You can decide if your favorite shooting scenario are at risk for this effect. Do you have lots of straight up and down lines in your scenes while you're panning? The R8 also has a 30 frame per second raw burst mode that even allows pre-buffering. That is, it continuously records and when you hit the shutter button, it backs up half a second and starts registering photos from that moment. I gave it a try, but in the end, I didn't like it. The half second isn't enough to capture much that you missed. You really need to be on a tripod aiming at your subject and ready to fire. But in the end, it's the usability and workflow that I didn't like. First, it creates a stack as one file in your camera from which you need to extract individual frames. You can't zoom in on the photos to inspect the sharpness before extracting them, and you have to extract them in camera or using Canon's DPP proprietary software, both of which were cumbersome to do. In the end, just use the electronic shutter. To keep the weight and price down, the camera uses a smaller battery than the R5 and the R6, while it can shoot fewer frames than the larger batteries, I was pleasantly surprised. I went out for a short walk and took 350 photos and didn't even reduce the battery indicator by even one tick. I'll share later how much I got shooting wildlife. You can also charge this by USB if you can give it enough power using a power delivery USB-C source. The R8 is also down to one card slot, which is SD, but in this price class, that will often be the case. Rather than have a separate memory card door, it shares the door with the battery. At first, I found this a bit odd, but within two outings, it was a non-issue. In terms of other things that it shares with the R5 and the R6, flippy screen, mic jack, USB, and micro HDMI out, all are on there. It doesn't have a joystick for moving the autofocus point, but with a great touchscreen, this doesn't seem to be a huge hurdle. I do miss the scroll wheel at the back that's now a D-pad, but it works great. Now for the LCD, Canon always makes good LCD screens, and I didn't notice a big difference with my R5 and R6 in comparison. Bright enough for great usability for menu changes, zooming in, and swiping through pics. The EVF is a lower quality than the R5, and you can tell the difference when comparing, but if you didn't have another one to compare it to, it wouldn't be an issue. The R8 has great video features, 4K from full width 6K capture up to 60 frames per second, the 120 frames per second video is only at 1080 though, whereas the R5 can do it at 4K, but these are still solid specs. The 4K 60 is a 30 minute limit, but a two hour limit on the 4K 24 or 4K 30, and no overheating, at least on any of my uses. While it doesn't have sensor stabilization, it has two modes of digital stabilization, normal and enhanced, 
which digitally crops and stabilizes by adjusting the video footage to look smoother. The enhanced image stabilization does an even better job, but it does crop the image in quite a bit, so you need to be conscious of your field of view. Here are a few clips of the 120 frame per second footage at 1080. You can see that it can create some really cinematic and smooth footage handheld, like this waterfall shot handheld with image stabilization on at 50 millimeters, showing how you can make some smooth looking footage for your video work. Speaking of video, why did I buy this camera if I have an R5 and an R6? That's because I often use both of these cameras out in the field and I needed to swap out my R6, which I usually use to record these videos, every time I needed to use it. So I wanted a permanent studio camera. It turns out that all the things Canon did to keep the price down impacted things I don't use in recording these videos. Smaller battery, don't use it. No IBIS, not using it. One card slot, doesn't matter. You know what I mean. And finally, some big news and a chance to win a new super telephoto lens like this one in a new partnership between myself and the Journal of Wildlife Photography. I'm excited to announce that we're launching a wildlife photography course, Wildlife Photo Essentials with Simon D'Entremont. More than four hours of lessons in 16 modules teaching you all of my best tricks. This course is targeted at people early to intermediate in their wildlife photography journey, covering everything from camera settings for wildlife, autofocus tricks, understanding light, field techniques, and how to make artful photos. And because you asked for it, two whole modules on post-processing. It also includes four bonus modules and over an hour of extra content for free, including three never before seen behind the scenes modules. But here's the best part. The 500 first purchases of the course have an added bonus. We're going to have a photo contest amongst them, showing off the new photos they've been able to get, with the winner getting a new $13,000 RF Canon 600mm f4 super telephoto lens, or the equivalent value of their favorite brand. Really. But you need to be in the first 500 to buy the course to be eligible for this prize. The link to the course website is in the notes below. Hope to see you and your photos over at our community page very soon. The autofocus of this camera is where the R8 shines. Even at this low price point, this camera can stand up to any camera of any brand at any price, period. It has eye and subject detection for people, animals, and automobiles, and can track them all beautifully. The photos from this camera are gorgeous. It's the same sensor as the R6 Mark II, and it's great. I've used the original R6 in all kinds of situations, including shooting the Milky Way, and this sensor is just as good. The shadows can be recovered without terrible noise and color distortions, and highlights can be recovered when overexposed, especially if you shoot in RAW. To note, the first curtain shutter creates a 14-bit RAW file for maximum quality, while the electronic shutter creates a lower quality 12-bit file. So the first curtain shutter technically has better files. That being said, I've compared the 14-bit and 12-bit files from our series cameras before, and it's almost impossible to tell them apart without stretching the files that are badly under and overexposed and pixel peeping to the extreme. Almost a non-issue. And speaking of wildlife photography, I just needed to try out the new R8 on some birds. I took it out a couple times to see what it can do. To be honest, my expectations were low. Stripped down camera, low frame rate, small battery, no joystick. I may as well burst the bubble now, it knocked my socks off. Let's go over some of the things that wildlife photographers care about. First, the frame rate, let's face it, six frames per second isn't blazing, but I was pleasantly surprised that in many scenes, I didn't find it terribly slow. I used a Canon 5D Mark IV for a few years at seven frames per second and I survived and the R8 autofocus easily beats it. While six frames per second in the first curtain mode isn't fast, this thing shoots 40 frames per second in electronic shutter mode, which in my experience is very usable. I shot flying tree swallows and flying red winged blackbirds using the electronic shutter and I don't see any distortion or not enough to bother noticing. The buffer for continuous shooting is okay in six frames per second mode and you'll get around 85 shots or 14 seconds, so that's plenty. But for the 40 frame per second mode, you only get 52 in full raw, so you need to wait for peak action before you start shooting, as you can bog it down pretty quickly. Now in 12-bit compressed raw, you get roughly double that. And compressed raw is 99.5% as good as raw and worth trying. That's what I'd use if I use this camera for wildlife. I'd get twice the buffer and files that you'll never notice are different than the raw files. Now here's that electronic shutter in action. This red winged blackbird was flying around three or four perches around its territory. I set up and waited for it to jump and move to the next one. Bang, I hit the shutter button as it took off and I took 35 images in a row in less than one second. All sharp and all in focus. 
But at 40 frames per second, you have lots of photos to go through. Too many, really. I wouldn't shoot it at 40 frames per second all the time. Here's what I'd do. I'd program 6 frames per second at C1 on the custom functions dial and 40 FPS at C2. So this way, I'd shoot 6 frames per second as my main setup, but when I thought some fast action would happen, I'd just switch to C2. Smartly, the dial is changeable with your thumb even while looking in the viewfinder. Autofocus is where a wildlife camera needs to have it, and this one nails it. Fast and super sticky. There were a few times where branches in front of my birds would attract the focus for a bit before locking onto my subject's eye, but that's like 5% of the time. And it was super sticky. I think it actually jumped to the background less when it lost a subject against a clean background than the R5 and the R6, so that's a big plus. As for battery life, I was pleasantly surprised. I shot over 2,000 photos on one battery one outing, and in another outing, I shot 1,000 shots and still had half the battery left. No problem. You'll likely want a second battery for a day out, but you don't need to have pockets full of batteries. As for buttons and dials and lack of a scroll wheel, I was worried about it a bit, but it was fine. I find for wildlife you need two wheels, one for the shutter speed and one for either ISO or exposure compensation, depending how you shoot. The aperture isn't something you need to change on the fly very often. So I shoot in manual with auto ISO and I have exposure compensation on the top thumb dial. As for the files, they're gorgeous. Here's a collection of photos I took using the R8, all in less than three hours. And while doing tests for this video, give me a couple of weeks with this thing and taking wildlife photos and I'm pretty sure I could get some really nice photos. So who's this for and what about the R7, R6, R6 Mark II and R5? The small size and full frame sensor on this make this a great travel camera. With the RF 16 millimeter attached, I can fit this in a jacket pocket. With only one card slot, I wouldn't recommend this as a wedding or pro photographer's main body, but it could work as a discretionary backup. I'd get the R6 and the R6 Mark II for pro work. For tripod work like landscapes where the sensor stabilization might be less critical, this would be a great camera for hikes and adventures, especially with its lightweight. Same for Milky Way shooting where it's all tripod work, like this stuff I shot with the R6. This camera could do this no problem. For handheld nighttime photography and outdoor portraits where you might use lower shutter speeds regularly, I'd pair it with an image stabilized lens at the least. An R6 or R6 Mark II would be worth a bit extra here. And yes, for wildlife photography, it can definitely work for sure. Now for dedicated wildlife camera, I do think the R6 or R6 Mark II are better if you can swing it with 12 frames per second, mechanical shutters, and a bunch of other goodies. But as a camera that needs to do it all plus get wildlife, it can definitely do the job. If you can swing it and you crop your images a lot, the 45 megapixel R5 is amazing and the best out there in my view for wildlife. If you want to shoot mainly wildlife and 400 millimeters is the longest lens you're likely to get, consider the R7. It has a good frame rate, 33 megapixel crop sensor, excellent autofocus, and at 400 millimeters will give you the equivalent of 640 millimeters in full frame equivalent reach. 400 on a full frame for wildlife is just a bit short for reach, unless you're shooting very large animals very close. Those tightly packed megapixels on the R7 will make it more croppable also for more detail. If you're wondering what settings I changed when I got my new R8, and I change every time I get a new camera, check out this video. If this video was deserving, give it a like and YouTube will show it to even more people. I hope you can use this information to get the right camera for you, and I hope you can go out there and get some amazing photos. I know you can do it.